This is your host, Ronnie Fernandez, LCSW, licensed clinical therapist and owner of Ronnie Fernandez Therapy, but for guys. If you want to know more about me and my private practice, go to RonnieFernandez.com. Hello and welcome to Mindset, the guy podcast where men talk about their life challenges and how they, how they were able to overcome them. My goal with this podcast is to help men better express their thoughts and develop a mindset to better deal with, with their life challenges. This podcast is not clinical therapy. The men that I interview are not my clients, but have great stories on how they were able to develop a mindset to conquer their challenges. I'm not a professional interviewer or host, so please forgive me for all the ums, pauses, and misplaced words. With that being said, let me introduce you to my next guest. Thank you for joining me for the for the podcast. Um, John is, a, is actually a, a family member that um, that uh, that went through some uh, some heart issues and and um, had a really incredible story um, to share. And it actually came on a local paper. And he, he's um, going around and sharing his story. And uh, I just thought it would be important for for men to kind of go, you know, just kind of hear hear about your journey and to um to kind of understand like things happen and you know when you're you know you're healthy and active and uh things still do happen and i just want you know just want you to be able to to kind of share your story so um thanks john for joining us Uh, you're welcome (laughs) thank you for having me so i just want to kind of get started at the beginning like how did your life look um right before um that you got diagnosed and it happened um everything was flowing Everything was good. Uh, I referee high school and collegiate soccer. I coach. I work. Um, didn't know there was any issues upcoming. Um, I went into a soccer game on a Thursday. I had a physical set up for Friday. I went to the physical, and when they did some tests, did an EKG, that's when uh, the whole thing started. Um, the doctor came back and said that they were going to send me by paramedics to the hospital. And I, I kind of looked at him like, you know, you're crazy, doctor. I, I just ran, you know, two 90-minute college games this week, and you're telling me that I, my heart's no good. He says, well, I, I think you're having a major heart attack. So I says, uh, okay. I says, uh, you know, my wife's out here right now. I says, I'll have her drive me. He says, no, you're going by paramedics. And I says, you know, Doc, I, you know, I don't want to do that. What happens if somebody really needs those paramedics, you know, and I want I could drive mm-hmm. myself. And he says, no, you're going to go. And I says, okay. I says, I'll go downstairs and I'll meet him downstairs. And he says, no, you won't. You're going to stay here in the room and they're going to come up and get you. And at that point, I thought, man, you know, something must be really wrong. This guy's really serious about, you know, keeping me here. So he, he kind of made a comment about, if you don't want to go down on the gurney, we'll go ahead and get the gurney up here and we'll just cover you up so nobody can see you. And I kind of looked, I said, that's even worse, right? <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, that's... Yeah, <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, you know, people are going to think, you know, the poor guy passed. Yeah. So when I got down to the, they came and got me, and I got down to the paramedics, and my wife says that I'm going to meet you at the hospital. Well, I had sent her to a different hospital, and the paramedics were going to take me to another hospital, and I didn't want to go to that hospital. And so they says, well, this is where dispatch is sending us, and this is where you have to go. And I told them, I says, well, thank you guys for your services. I appreciate everything. And I started to climb back out of the, the wagon. I undid my belt and got out of the gurney. And the paramedic came up to me, and he says, listen, he says, last week we had a guy that we went to go pick up, and he didn't want to go right away. He wanted to stay and finish what he was doing, and the guy passed on the way. And I says, you know, guys, I'm not asking you to finish what I'm doing or nothing. I says, I just, I'm not comfortable going to where you want to take me. And it was right across the street from where I was at. So they called dispatch, and dispatch says, no, you have to take him to where we're going. So I says, well... I appreciate it. You know, thank you guys. And I, I, by this time, I'm already out of the paramedics. So about not even a minute, I, I feel his hand on my shoulder. And the guy says, come on, coach, relax. And I turned around, and it was one of my ex-players. His wow. partner and himself, I had coached both. So he says, let me see what I can do. 
So he calls dispatch again. Now they're getting a little flustered because this is like the fourth call. And they says, no, we've already told you guys, this is where you're taking him. He has to go there. So he tells me, he says, John, we can't do nothing. This is where we got to go. And I says, well, you know, Brian, I appreciate it. Thank you, buddy. I says, but I want to call my wife back. I says, but you know what? She took my phone. Can one of you guys call? And he says, you know what? Let me try again. So he calls again. And the ladies, before he even answered, and she's giving him his answer. He says, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You're breaking up. You're breaking up. And he hung up. He says, we're going to take you where you want to go. That decision was the, the really the first thing that saved my life. Because when I got to the hospital where they took me to, he told me there was going to be some issues. He says, they're going to be upset. People are going to be yelling. He says, but let me take the, that heat. You just worry about yourself. So when we got there, sure enough, it was hell broke loose. Everybody's yelling at them for bringing me there because they weren't ready for me. Once I got there, they took me back. Um, doctor came in. They, the guy did an EKG. He didn't even finish the EKG. He rips off the tabs, and I've never seen a wheelchair spin the wheels. <laughs> he spun the wheels, man, rushing me back. So I, I told him, I says, relax, relax. I says, I'm okay. And I took out the strip of the EKG that the doctor gave me at the office, and they matched. So that kind of, you know, it put him at ease. Yeah. So the doctor that came in to see me, a cardiologist there, he says, you know, we're going to do an angiogram, but i got to keep you overnight. So I says, okay, you know, then in the morning we'll do it. So in the morning he comes back, and he says, you know, Johnny, he says, uh, I know you from somewhere, but I can't place it. And, excuse me, he asked me, he says, what do you do? And I said, uh, well, you know, we're in the meat distribution business, and I coach uh, baseball and soccer, and I referee high school and collegiate soccer. He says, that's it. He says, I play for a British pub team out in Orange County. You referee my matches. <laughs> wow. And I just did, like, two weeks prior to that. Coincidentally... And me and him work very tight together today. His name is Dr. Beckham. <laughs> so my first question yeah. was, are you related yeah. to, you know, and he says, I wish, <laughs> you know, he says, I try to play like yeah. him, but it's not there. <laughs> like like yeah. <laughs> so he uh, did an angiogram and came back and I could see on his face. He's not a poker player because I read his face. Yeah. Something looked wrong, seriously. And he says, you know, Johnny, he says, uh, you have a major problem. And I says, what is it? He says, it's cardiomyopathy. He says, the left side of your heart is like a callus on your hand. It's hard. And it won't pump. He says, and I couldn't get stents in. There's no blood flowing through that side. So I says, well, what are we going to do? What's, what do you think is the best result? He says, well, eventually you're going to need a transplant. I said, what? He says, you're going to need a heart transplant. And I heard a kidney transplant and stuff like that, but I'd never heard you know, anybody getting a heart transplant. And so all my family's in there with me. And I mean, I, I could see their face and I can imagine what my face looked like. And I says, well, can we fix it with medicine? And he says, we're, we're going to get you on meds. He says, but it's just going to control. He says, but the, our goal is to get you into a transplant. So I says, okay. He says, I want to put a, uh, a defibrillator in. And so he referred me to a doctor to go do the defibrillator. And I, I went. Uh, my wife went. My sister went with us because everybody's worried. Because what they called what I had is a widow maker. And that means you can drop yeah. at any time. So I went to the, the doctor and we talked and I, I, me and him didn't click. The guy was taking personal phone calls during our visit and it was like I wasn't, it was nothing serious. Well, maybe to him it wasn't because it's something that he does all the time. 
But to me, I wanted answers. I, I wanted, you and they're, know. And they're putting the Widowmaker in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I, I was worried. Yeah. And so uh, he got a phone call, and he went outside. And he had a little podium with him that, you know, he was writing stuff on. I grabbed the cord, and I pulled him back in the podium. And I says, you know, Doc, I says, I'm leaving. I says, I'm sorry. I says, it's pretty rude. I he says, you're taking personal phone calls. I can understand if it's medical issues or you got a patient. But these are, per I could tell they were personal phone calls. So I left. And I, I called Dr. Beckham and I told him. And he says, well, we got to get it in some way, somewhere. So at this time, I had already set up an appointment with the transplant hospital. And so I went to the transplant hospital and I talked to them and they got me another doctor to do it. So I'm in the hospital, um, checking everything out, and they says, okay, this is what we're going to do. They set up a plan. So I went home, and one Sunday, I didn't feel right. And this whole time, I feel okay. You know, I feel good. But this Sunday, I just didn't feel right. And uh, I told my wife, you know, let's go to the doctor. Let's go up to the hospital. And she knew right then that, because I'm not the kind of guy that wants to go. I try to put it off as... You know if I can so we go up to Cedars they admit me and uh, they says you know we, we got to get you a, a defibrillator in but we're gonna do an angio another angiogram and this doctor comes out and he tells me that what he wants to do and I says you know doctor I says you're the doctor I says but I've had other doctors say that they can't put stints in he says I can do it so uh, I says, okay, you know, the ball's in your hands. So we go and we do the angio. And I'm awake during the whole process. And I'm watching it on a big screen. And he's talking to his fellows. Because Cedars is a teaching hospital. So yeah. there, there's other fellows there that are, are watching. And he says, you know, it might be a day or two before we get blood. He says, but I got two stents in. And I says, man, you know, you're pretty amazing <laughs> yeah oh, wow and so that kind of brought up my hopes you know mm -hmm. thinking that this is it so he started talking about soccer he was asking me questions about soccer as he's doing the procedure and all of a sudden he tells his colleagues there he says look look blood 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 and he had already got blood flowing wow, wow. so we waited uh, about 45 minutes and then they took me back to my room and they says, we still want to get a defibrillator put in. And they did some tests, a nuclear test and stuff. And it, it worked, but it didn't work. The heart was too damaged already. Mm. And so the original goal, it was still transplant. Yeah. So they gave me a um, time to do the defibrillator. They call insurance and they says, you know, we got to get it done here while you're here. And the insurance wouldn't cover it. They wanted to wait 45 days to make sure that the angiogram didn't work. The stents didn't work. Yeah. And the doctors, they didn't feel comfortable sending me home with it. Yeah. So they gave me a life vest. And what a life vest is, it's a like a hunting vest that has paddles that go inside the pockets in the yeah. front and the back. And it'll shock you. It's like an external defibrillator. And um, I says, well, is it going to work? And he says, yeah, it's, it'll work. He says, you know, a green dial will shoot out on you. That way we know that it had gone off. But what you got to do is you got to call an 800 number when you get the alarm. And really? <laughs> I see the look on your face. Yeah. And I, I was, <laughs> <laughs> 1 800 number. <laughs> 1 800. Wow. And then when they answer, it's a recording. And it says, if you speak English, push one. If you speak Spanish, push two. And I'm thinking to myself, what kind of operation is this? Yeah. Well, if you don't call within 45 seconds of the alarm, it automatically shocks you because it thinks that you had passed out. So I got it on a Monday. Monday night, I had an alarm. So I'm panicking. Man. I'm calling that 1-800 number, you know, and... It's just a false alarm. Mm. So then Tuesday, by the end of Tuesday, it had gone off 13 times. Wow. And never shocked me, 
-hmm. but the alarms go off. Yeah. The nurses were going crazy, and I feel so sorry for them because every time they hear this alarm, they panic, and, mm -hmm. and they come in, and they started making the call for me. Yeah. And so the doctors came back in on Wednesday morning, and they says, you know what? You're not going home. I was supposed to go home that day yeah. with this life vest. He says, you're, you're staying here until we get it in. Wow. So the following night, I went into uh, um, VTEC. Mm -hmm. And what that is, it's a heart rate that just races. And it got up to 200 beats per minute. And just imagine running in a marathon and you're at the 25th mile. That's the way my heart rate was. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't come down. So they tried everything. They took me up to ICU. I got to ICU. They got ice on my head. They're pumping my legs. Uh, my wife, she's got one leg. The other nurse has got the other leg. They're trying everything to get it down. They gave me an a IV of uh, lidocaine to try to bring it down. Didn't bring it down. So the doctor called me in and he says, you know, we might have to shock you. And I says, well, you know, doc, if it's going to help, you know, whatever you have to do. I says, but are you going to give me something? Is it going to hurt or what? He says, no, we'll take care of it. You know, we'll give you something. So I says, okay. And so I'm scared. Yeah. I, I I just, I, I'm, I don't know if my heart's just going to explode or yeah. what. And now I start thinking about my family, my boys. Uh, I, I'm really scared. I wasn't scared up until this point. Yeah. Um, I was worried, you know, about transplant and all that. But as far as thinking that it's over now, I, it was, it was now. Mm -hmm. And so they, they brought in a, a bolus of lidocaine and the box that it came in was like a box of good and plenty. You know, those purple and black boxes. It's a, a candy box. Oh yeah. And so I, I made a joke. I, I said, you know, doc, I, I hope you're going to, or the nurse that was doing it. I hope you're going to share those with me. And he looked at me and he says, this is no time for jokes. You're swirling around the drain. And man, I looked at wow. Caroline and I thought, oh my God, you know, this is not good. So they gave me the bolus. And uh, by this time, I know how to read all the meters. Yeah. And as the meters go, I'm watching my heart rate. Heart rate's dropping. My blood pressure's dropping. My heart rate goes from two to 170, 160. 150, 190, 80, 70, 65. When it hit 65, I'll never forget that number. I couldn't see nobody. Everything wow. got real blurry. And I told the doc, I says, you know, doc, he says, something's not right. He says, what do you mean? I says, you're blurry. I says, everything is real fuzzy. And he walked around to the end of the bed and bam, he hit the button. Wow. Shock me. Um, just like in the movies, the legs come up, you, you hit the bed. And before he did it, he asked my wife to leave the room. And petrified, petrified. I, I, my, I could just feel, you know. Yeah. When he shocked me, though, he says, you know, during all this time, they had gotten okay to do a defibrillator. And the insurance agreed to it. So he says, we're going to send you to the uh, operating room. We're going to put in a defibrillator now. I says, well, you fixed me. I says, look, my blood pressure is 120 over 80. My heart rate's 90. I says, that's good. He says, we didn't fix nothing. He says, we just got your heart to slow down. He says, we got to get the defibrillator in because it could happen any time again. I says, okay, doc. I says, but I got two questions. I says, one of them was, I heard the loudest pop it was like a crack when it happened. And I says, it was like taking a stick and snapping it, you know, it was mm -hmm. like that. He says, well, that was electricity going to your brain. You know, when you plug in a uh, plug into the wall and it arcs, Yeah. that's what it did. Wow. And I says, the second thing was, I seen the brightest light that I had ever seen in my life. And the doc kind of put his head down and he says, I can't answer that one. And he walked away. Hmm. Ronnie, after that, I never was worried. Hmm. It was like something came into my body, you know, the Holy Spirit or whatever it was. 
and, and just took control. Um, I wasn't scared. I, I wasn't worried about my family no more. Um, I went, did the defibrillator, um, felt good. The next day, they come in, they interrogate it. They interrogate it with a laptop and a wand. And they go around it, and then they can control it by the laptop. And you can literally feel it adjusting. You can feel like a little flutter in your heart wow. when they adjust it. Um, then they sent me home. Five weeks later, I uh, was doing dishes with one of my boys. And they asked me, he says, you know, what's wrong, Dad? And I says, ah, nothing. He says, you kind of look pale. I said, well, I feel lightheaded. And uh, he says, what do you mean? I just, I just feel lightheaded. So I, I just thought maybe it was the hot water I'm using or whatever, you know, I didn't think of it. And so I passed out. But I didn't fall. I, I just kind of went to my knees a little, or to my hands to my knees. Mm -hmm. And I says, oh, man. And I get up, and he says, uh, actually, I thought I was putting something in one of the drawers. That's why I was lower. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, your defibrillator went off. And I says, no, I didn't. I says, they told me it would be like a horse kicking me in the chest. And I didn't feel nothing. He says, Dad, it did. He says, I felt it. I says, what do you mean? He says, I grabbed you. And I felt, felt it. He says, and your lips were going, you know. Wow. And so I says, well, you know, we better call. So I called the transplant center, mm -hmm. and they told me, get straight to the nearest hospital yeah. and get it interrogated. So I did. I went to where I, the original hospital I was at. They interrogated it. It had gone off twice. Wow. And you didn't feel it? I didn't feel it. I didn't feel nothing. And so I asked about, you know, after why mm -hmm. I didn't feel it. Because they kept telling me it was going to hurt. You know, it was like a horse. And they says, well, because you were passed out. Oh. Okay, now why did I pass out? Why yeah. did I feel the pain? You know, yeah. that, that was always yeah. in my mind, you know. So uh, they took me to the hospital. They did it twice. Um, they says, okay, we're going to keep you overnight for observation. We're going to send you home tomorrow. That night I went into cardiac arrest. They intubated me, basically put me in a coma, put me on life support. Told my family that there was nothing to do. We're going to set them up with hospice here and just time to let them pass. You know, that's all we can do. And my wife says, no, we're going to get him back to the transplant center. And Dr. Beckham said the same thing. But the head of cardiology and of the department says, no, we're keeping him here. And Dr. Beckham fought, says, no, we're going to send him back to Cedars. And the guy's response was, and this is just hearsay that they told me because I was intubated, was that Cedars couldn't do nothing that we can't do here. Yeah. And my wife says, no, I'm calling. So she called, and they got set up over there for me. Dr. Beckham got on the Internet because he's not a transplant doctor. He didn't know, you know, what to do mm -hmm. and found out what drugs that I would need to get started for the transplant. So he got me started, um, got a special ambulance, and he told my wife, he's straight out, he says, this is going to be a 50-50 ride, you know, if he makes it. She says, well, he's a gambler. He's going to, you know, he's going to want that, <laughs> yeah. that chance, yeah. you know, it's better than just laying. Yeah. So it was a special ambulance that they wouldn't even let her ride. It had um, a respiratory therapist. It had a cardiologist. It had a surgical tech and um, a pulmonary a lung guy. So I get there. Uh, two days go by no heart available for transplant. And so they had already talked to me prior about different devices and stuff. Well, my organs were starting to fail. And you got to stay healthy for a transplant. If It's a catch-22 thing. If you're too sick, you won't get it. If you're too healthy, you won't get it. You know, mm -hmm. it's right there. So what they did was they implanted the total artificial heart. Um, when yes. I got that, I was one in 50 in the U.S. Wow. that got it. What, what is that? It, it's a plastic heart that it's made out of a, a 
like a rubber material that hardens and it's a left ventricle and a right ventricle and it's connected by velcro and they it's just like an open heart surgery they crack yeah. you open and they implant it into you yeah and it's got two leads that come out of it with hoses and the hoses connect to an external compressor yeah and it goes into my side and connects and there's a connection outside but the the artificial heart inside is literally sewed into the the arteries that are connected to the original heart so in the machine that the uh, artificial heart that you're on the compressor it's about the size of a a craftsman toolbox Mm. the original one was like three thousand pounds wow and uh they got the okay for the the program in 2008 for a trial yeah it got approved in 2012. so this is something that's really really new yeah um when i woke up i I told my wife she was like she was right there when i woke up i says you know i says i i know this is a great hospital i says but i've never seen a hospital that did their own laundry and she says what do you mean i says that washing machine has been going all night long i said don't you hear it (laughs) it was my heart it was the machine (laughs) And how are you doing now? How's, Good. How's how Good. long has it been? Uh, I got my transplant August twenty second, two thousand sixteen. Wow. It'll be three years this August. Wow, that's an amazing journey. And what are what are some of the things that you that you know through 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 hard times, difficult times, we kind of have to see what we learned from from that experience. I mean, what did you did you learn anything from? One hundred percent. You know. Don't take nothing for granted because we never know. I, I was healthy. Um, I was living life. Everything was good. And overnight, this happened. Yeah. Overnight. Um, when I got the artificial heart, there, there was n- not limitations, but there were some things. You couldn't shower because you have an open wound. Uh, you can't take the backpack in water. Um, I, they transfer me from the big machine to a backpack size machine that was portable okay. uh, it weighed about 16 pounds so I carried it around um, I could see where somebody could take and just become a hermit mm. not want to come out because when I came into a room you heard me yeah. it was loud it was like a washing machine yeah um, but I lived because I didn't know how long It would be I didn't know you know it could be tomorrow it could be the next day Um, I was able to see one of my sons graduate from high school one from college and my grandbaby being born and each one of those experiences meant so much to me because at one time I didn't know if I'd be there for those those yeah Wow what would you tell somebody that's 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 that going through this kind of similar situation where they're healthy things are going fine and then boom something like this happened never quit living life yeah. never quit living life do what you're told don't take the negative um, as the positive always think that there, there's a better side of, of the negative um, create your own positive feelings um, believe in people, trust people, surround you, surround yourself with positive people, not negative people. We're not looking for sympathy. Yeah. We're, we're looking for people that, that are going to bring us to that next level of getting better. Um, I had friends that they were scared to come over because they didn't know what to expect. Yeah. You know, um, I, when I got the total artificial, I asked the doctors, I says, what can I do? Is there any limitations? No, we want you to live life. So I says, okay, I, so I can walk, I, I can do, I can exercise, I can do everything. Yes, because we want you to stay healthy for transplant. Because the healthier you are for transplant, 
the easier it's going to be. Mm-hmm. One of the, the hardest things for me at first was when I started thinking about the transplant, somebody has to pass for me to live. Mm-hmm. That was tough. Yeah. yeah. That was tough. Because when somebody dies for your joy, you know, yeah. I mean, and what I mean by joy it is to be able to live. Yeah. So uh, now I'll go talk to people that are waiting for transplants and stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the number one questions that I get. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about somebody having to pass for you to live? Yeah. And my conclusion was, and, and like I said, after I got shocked, mm-hmm. I had somebody with me all the time. Yeah. Um, I never took a pain pill after a transplant, after the artificial or the other one. I was never in pain. Um, I I was never worried. So I I tell everybody, I says, what you're getting is the gift of life. And that person that's given it to you wanted to do it. It's not, we're not buying it. We're not forcing it. You know, somebody's not stealing it. It's a gift that another human being has given to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I can see the yeah the, that that point of view is yeah it is a gift somebody is giving yes. you something and when somebody does give you something nice it's it's good to receive it you know like when somebody gives you a compliment it's you know sometimes we're like ah but no you, you have to receive that compliment right. and like embrace it like okay thank you for that right for that. right so I talked to a seventeen year old girl in uh, Tucson, Arizona. She had a flu virus, she thought. She went into the emergency, and it was. It was a virus that attacked her heart. Mm-hmm. And it, it took her heart, and she had to get the artificial heart. So we sat down and we talked. And she says, you know, Johnny, she says, I don't think it's fair that somebody else has to die for me to live. And I says, They don't have to die. I says, it's an accident. I says, it's something that happened naturally. And they chose to give you that gift. This is why we don't, we shouldn't feel like we stole something or something. Mm -hmm. It's a gift that you got. And she understood it. She, um, she started going out more. Um, She would go to the movies because her parents had told me, she wouldn't leave the house. Yeah. She didn't. She was just devastated. And I could see why, you know, because people stare at you. Yeah. Um, I, I did an interview with one of the newspapers, and one of the questions I got was, how do you feel about being looked at? And I says, you know, I would rather be looked at than viewed. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's the truth. Yeah. Right? And so I... I I lived. Yeah. I, I didn't let it stop me because I didn't know if tomorrow was there. I enjoyed my family. Um, they wanted to go someplace. I went. Yeah. Um, we we celebrated the holidays together. Um, uh, even though I was kind of an inconvenience sometimes for people because I had to have somebody with me 24-7. Mm. That was hard yeah. because, you know, we all want our personal space. Yeah. And I really couldn't have it because somebody had to be with me all the time. I mean, we, as long as we're in the same house. Yeah. Because if an alarm went off and we had to change the machine, mm-hmm. it took two people. Yeah. So you kind of lose a little bit of your yeah. independence. Yeah. But I'm alive. Yeah. You know, yes. I'm alive. Wow. Thanks, John. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And and I know you know your words of wisdom and and sharing your story are, are going to help a lot of men. So oh, thank, you. thank you, John. I appreciate yeah, it. You're welcome. Thank you. you know one thing about our gut feelings, hmm. you have to run with them hmm. because those paramedics, if they didn't do what they did, I would have never met Doctor Beckham. Yeah. And if I wouldn't have met Doctor Beckham, I would have been left in hospice. How, how important is that? Is that showing 
your personality and being persistent with things because as as a lot of men we don't we don't we're just like okay all right and we'll look for our wives right 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 no <laughs> you, you're right you're right how how was important to talk to the doctor and get to know them and find some kind of interest in being personal very important very important um i i'm very good friends with all of them the nurses um, whenever I go to, to the appointments, to the clinic, to the hospital, I go up and see every one of them. Mm-hmm. And I see you to the step down ward to thank them for what they did for me. Yeah. Um, Dr. Beckham, we have developed a relationship. And I, I told him, I says, you know what? You saved my life. I, I gave him a card at the holiday time and stuff. And, and I made a note one time about saving my life. And he says, Johnny, I didn't do nothing. I, I says, what do you mean you didn't do nothing? I says, by your decision and by your going against your superiors yeah. to make the decisions that you made what was part of me still being here. Because if those decisions wouldn't have been made, I would have been left to pass. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Great information, John. Because, yeah, we, we are definitely... A lot of us are just kind of go with the flow type thing and just kind of like, okay, but yeah, yeah. Thank you, John. You're welcome. All right. You're welcome. That's it. Thanks. Thank you for sharing, man. That was was good. That's that's an amazing story. Wow. Just all the pieces, you know? All the pieces. You know, in the, you know, the, the ambulance guys and you know and like man yeah. and i didn't recognize them i mean no because you know they're in their mid-20s and yeah. I, they were 13 12 13 when i coached them man. and i mean that that's the guys that really started it yeah you know yeah and god just just think i, I went to the fire station and talked to him and i told him i said you know you guys took a chance because if something would have happened on that transport, yeah, they would have been, yeah, you know, um, that would have been their ass. Yeah, yeah. oh, shit. shit. But it's and, and you know, Ronnie. I mean, I, I've been raised a Catholic. Uh, yeah. We go to church and all that. But when people say about that, yeah. seeing the light, yeah. Ever since then, man, it's different. Yeah. It's different. It's crazy because, I mean, I started interviewing people that I've interviewed, the fourth person I've interviewed, and it's just, there's a lot of, like, faith involved. And and I'm, I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to, like, but there's always some sort of, like, you, you need that guidance, you know? I had hernia surgery in February. Yeah. I had a cut that big. That's it. I was waiting for every six hours to take a pain pill. I've cracked open from here to here, from here to here with 13 holes and never took one. Both times. Yeah. That's amazing. God. Now, you, you talk about feeling guilty. Yeah. When the nurses came, when I had the artificial heart in the hospital, what happened was I got the call at home, and I seen it on the phone, Cedar Sinai. Yeah. And I, I hollered at the kids. I said, you know what? I, I think I, I got a heart. Yeah. So I picked it up, and it was the coordinator, but it wasn't the heart. They were recalling the machine. The machines were shutting off without no warning. And one guy in Orange County, he was he was a Kaiser patient that Kaiser sent him to Cedars, and he got it. Well, he got he, he him and his wife they couldn't sleep in the same room mm. because it was too noisy for her. Yeah. Well, during the night it shut off. Wow. He only got forty five seconds. Jeez. So he passed. Wow. And so they wanted everybody to come in, and what it was was. The circuit board, there's a little set screw. And yeah. the vibration of the machine backed out the set screw. And the circuit board fell down and shorted out. 
while each backpack has two separate backups. Yeah. So if one goes bad, the other one fires it back up. If that goes bad, another one fires it back up. Well, when it fell down, it shorts them all out. So they, they called me and asked me, do you want to go home? You want to stay at home and we're going to send you a new backpack? Or do you want to come into the hospital? Well, in my mind, I knew if I was in the hospital, I would go up to a status one. Yeah. At home, I'm a status two. And at that time, I was number 15 on the list. Wow. So I went in. Yeah. And there was four of us that went in together. And we're all still today friends. Wow. And so I was the first one to get a heart. Well, every day, we would all get together in the hall. Yeah. We'd walk together, you know, um, I, my family and everybody was always there, the boys. And some yeah. of these guys, they, you know, they lived a long way away or whatever. Yeah. So they'd all come visit in my room. Well, when the nurses came and they told me that I, I had a match, mm -hmm. I felt bad. Yeah. I, I really, I, I told my mom, I, I told my Caroline, I said, don't say nothing to nobody. Yeah. Well, why? I said, don't say nothing to nobody. Yeah. I had a guilt feeling come over me. Yeah. You know, because these guys are still, yeah. you know. And so when they came to get me, they brought a gurney and they were going to take me in the gurney. And they had already switched me back to the bigger machine. And they says, okay, you know, we're going to take you now. And I says, okay. I says, but I don't want to go on the bed. Yeah. I says, what do you mean? I says, I want to walk. And they says, nobody walks to the OR. You know, we, we got to take. I says, no, no, I'm walking. So the boys, right away, they started on me. Ah, oh, he just wants to be a big shot. He wants to be the big macho <laughs> yeah. man, you know. And I says, no, it's not. Yeah. I, I says, I just want to walk. Yeah. And I never told nobody until after. Wow. I didn't know if that was going to be the last time I ever walked. Yeah. Wow. You know, I mean, I. Yeah. And so I wanted to walk. So I walked. Uh, we got down there. We did it. And then we were done and those guys knew yeah the other three guys they knew that i had gotten it because i shut myself off yeah that was as clue to, you know yeah, yeah. i, I should have just kept yeah. everything the same yeah. but <laughs> I, I just oh, oh man yeah. yeah that's that's amazing gosh it's a crazy story well yeah thank you john oh, you're welcome I no, appreciate thank you guys it's thank you guys for what you do it's so yeah. important you know i mean yeah. people need it People yeah. need it.